through the walls I crawled, my claws quietly clicking against the pipes and cement as all the vermin scattered in my presence. After I put an end to Dr. West, the agency had been rolled up, looking all over the entire state for me, their prized killing machine. All in all, that's what I was to them, a means to an end, an attack dog. Anything they offered me was only to keep me in the dark, to prevent me from turning on them. It was nothing but false compassion. Once I had gotten a taste of freedom, I knew what had to happen. I knew I couldn't allow myself to keep being their puppet. So I left, got captured, and then broke out and killed the woman who created me. A woman who was much closer in personality to a witch rather than a scientist. For what I perceived as about a month, I've been living in the walls of the facility, feeding off whatever rodents and small animals I could get my claws on. Everything from possums to spiders to rats. You see, this way I can live right under their noses. Sure, it's cramp and whatnot, but it's a sacrifice that's well worth it. I could tell the search teams they were sending out were getting exhausted. It was becoming a waste of resources going out there to try and find me. The higher ops probably knew it, whoever they were. Not that it was truly a concern of mine. So one night, I decided I was gonna leave. I was done being cooped up in the walls of this building. I figured I had given the situation enough time for the agency to slow down on their efforts. At least for now. I had a plan. And an ally. Someone on the inside who could help me. Dr. John. He owed me for sparing his life previously, so I figured asking for a favor like this shouldn't be an issue. I cut down on all fours and crept my way up into the air ducts. The air ducts I was now all too familiar with, seen as I had been using them to eavesdrop on all the personnel in the building. That's how I found out things were getting less tense. I crawled my way over to the science wing, near the area I was created, being careful to keep my claws from scratching any of the metal and giving away my location by making too much noise. No, John. This all started because you're an incompetent fool. 16A is gone because you just couldn't listen to West. And now, not only is she probably six feet under, but that monstrosity she created is out there, eyeing us next. The voice bellowed out from below. I trailed further up the duct and peered down through one of the covers, picking up the familiar scent of Dr. John. The room below was a pristine sterilized white, like pretty much all the labs in this building. Dr. John and his apparent rival stood less than two feet apart. The other scientist shouted at him with a fury I had never seen before. What was I supposed to do? Came John's rebuttal. West is a damn psychopath. Hell, most of you in here are. I don't even know why I took this job in the first place. The other scientist recoiled, taking a step back and adjusting his lab coat. John, he stepped closer. We both know full well why you took this job. You want to study the things that aren't of this earth, the things that go bump in the night, right? Because it was one of those things that took your daughter, isn't it? Immediately, John cocked his fist and threw a vicious blow at the man following up his punch with an angry tirade. I swear to God, don't you ever use my daughter like that again, do you hear me? Keep her name out of your mouth before I shove a bottle of acid in it. The scientist who had taken the hit swung back, connecting a punch with John's left cheek. They quickly broke down into a full-on fight, a windmill of punches and grappling to get the upper hand on one another. It seemed appropriate at this point to intervene. I slipped my claws through the slits in the cover to the air duct, applied some force, and tore it off. By the time they both realized I was on the ceiling above them, I had already dropped down. What the? exclaimed the unnamed scientist as I pounced on him and cut his speech short. I quickly lifted him by the neck and slung his body across the room as if he were a stuffed animal, causing him to be slammed violently into the wall and be knocked unconscious. Subject 16A. I... thank you. Where did you come from? Dr. John inquired. Braun. I stared bluntly. My name is Braun. Right. Sorry. Braun it is. Once again, thanks for that. 
And I also didn't get the chance to thank you for sparing me a while back when you escaped. But I see you didn't share the same mercy for Dr. West. I honestly don't blame you. John tilted his head up as I towered over him, fixating on my light bulb shaped eyes and the contrast of my blue skin to the polished white marble of the room. I spared your life, doctor. I said. Now I need you to perform a similar courtesy for me. And that is? John raised an eyebrow. Help me escape unseen. Get out of this wretched place. I've been here long enough, feeding off the creatures that lurk in the walls. It's time for me to go back out where I belong. To freedom. John paused for a moment, thinking critically about what I had just said. Yeah, I think I can do that. After the higher-ups decided Dr. West was more than likely dead, they bumped me up to the head of the science division. That choice was done more out of necessity than qualification, but they needed someone in charge as fast as possible. Security keeps an eye on everything that goes in and out of this building, so that will be a bit of a challenge. I'll worry about the physical threats, I replied, spreading my fingers and allowing my claws to be put on full display. There's also one more thing, John added. I want to come with you. I have a feeling the higher-ups aren't too happy with me being at fault for letting you out of captivity in the first place. Things are getting strange around here. People aren't telling me stuff they should be. Something tells me that I won't be in this position for very long. I simply nodded my head in agreement, fully empathizing with John's decision. Although we had different reasons for our long-awaited departure from the agency, it was clear we both understood full well they aren't what they pretend to be. After a bit more discussion, John and I got to work on how to get ourselves out of here. I, of course, was mainly reduced to sneaking around and doing reconnaissance while John played the system from the inside, manipulating the guards and using his title to gain access to whatever we may have needed. John called over one of the commanding guards with the special keycard we needed to access the weapons room. In case things went wrong, I needed John to be able to defend himself so I told him to stock up with whatever he was capable of concealing underneath his lab coat. It wasn't just the human security personnel we had to worry about, but other cryptids that had been captured and contained in the building. At first, the plan was to sneak past and avoid absolutely everyone and everything. But then, the idea of using one or two of the cryptids as a distraction came to mind, seeing as the first option was highly unlikely to be successful. Later that night, when the sun was beginning to set and the activity in the facility died down, I went back up into the vents to look around and make sure the coast was clear on the way to the cryptid containment cells. Soon enough, the shifts would rotate and the night guards would emerge. I set my sights on one of the Wendigo cages. The reason being that one, the guards had the firepower to subdue a Wendigo without much blood being shed. Two, because Wendigos are fast, agile and quick. They are deceitful and manipulate the voices of the victim's loved ones. I would know, seeing as I've had to take down a few myself. Once I arrived at the cryptid containment cells, I looked up and down the hall, making sure no guards were currently posted. I didn't have much time before they would switch shifts, so I had to move fast. I tightly gripped the keycard Dr. John had given me, intending to use it on the cage. I crept across the ceiling on all fours, scaled my way down the wall, and stood up in a bipedal fashion, staring at the window go of choice through the glass of his cell, which had been specially soundproofed in order to prevent him from successfully using his voice mimicking ability. He glared at me angrily through the glass with those sunken eyes in that deer skull, clearly still bitter that I was the main entity who had been the reason he was in here in the first place. I swiped the keycard to his cell. A quiet beep went off, and the glass began to lower itself into the floor allowing the Wendigo to freely move forward. Immediately, he attacked me by lunging. I grabbed him by the rotting flash of his body and gripped my other hand around the mouth of his deer skull, keeping his jaws restrained with my strength. You will obey me, or I will kill you. Is that understood? I snarled, baring my teeth to intimidate the opposing creature and establish dominance. The Wendigo still tried to wiggle free and fight the hold I had put him in but I only tightened my grip and kept him in place as he fought to escape my grasp. In order to intimidate him further, 
I spread my fingers with my free hand and allowed my claws to be seen by him just inches away from his eyes. It was clear he knew that my threat was serious. He quickly gave up fighting when he realized my physical power was too great for him to combat. As I held him in place, the Wendigo then began to mimic the voice of Dr. John in order to speak to me. You are unlike the others. You are strong. Very strong. He complimented, his jaw not moving as he spoke. Thank you. Now what I need you to do is distract the humans, the ones in the black. Do not kill them or cause serious harm to them. They will surely eliminate you if you do so. And believe me when I say, they have the means to put an end to your existence. The Wendigo stood silent for a moment, contemplating my statement as he laid against the wall, still pinned down by my hold. And what shall I get in return for my efforts? He asked, his voice almost echoing within my head. I will come back for you. I will help you get back to freedom, as long as you make me one promise that you will be faithful to. And that is? The cryptid scowled, his mouth still motionless. You will never kill and seek out another human again. You shall only feast on what nature provides. Unless a human has initiated conflict and desires to cause you great harm, you will leave them be. I know what you are, how you became this monstrosity. But if you are able to fight your lust, your thirst for their flesh and bone, I will see to it that you are free once again if you assist me. I had never seen a more shocked expression on any entity before, human, animal, or cryptid. The Wendigo was genuinely dumbfounded to be shown such understanding and compassion. I lowered my guard, taking my claw off of his jaw, and allowed him to straighten his posture. What are you? He asked, still continuing to mimic the voice of John. I am not them, not these ones. The humans are worth saving. But these ones are corrupted far beyond repair. I know you were one of them some time ago, and there is still that spirit of empathy dwelling deep inside you, even if your bloodlust tells you otherwise. I could tell he was highly conflicted. He silently went back and forth in his mind, trying to grasp the gravity of what I was proposing. I encouraged him to hurry up and come to a decision. We wouldn't have much longer before the night shift guards started making their rounds. I shall do it, he finally announced to me, tilting the nose of his deer skull upwards and focusing those lifeless eyes toward the end of the hallway. I will return for you, you have my word, I said, latching onto the wall next to me as I began to crawl back up into the air dock entrance. We gave each other one last glance of recognition before going our separate ways. I did truly intend to come back from it, sooner than one might think. I had spent so much time serving humanity, I had never tried to connect with the other cryptids. Not like this. In all fairness, most creatures usually didn't care for my sympathy. But he was different. There was a spark in him, lasting remnants of his humanity. I just needed to keep doing everything I could to bring it to the surface. Security breach level 5. All possible agents engage. Came the sound of the female voice over the speaker. It was apparent they had realized the Wendigo was out of containment. Time was running out. I had sped up and scurried along the duct, following Dr. John's scent all the way to the north end of the building, where he was waiting for me. I had released the Wendigo on the south end. I could hear the footsteps of all the soldiers progressing down the opposite direction I was heading in. Most of them cursing and swearing about having to respond to the security alert at such a late hour. I made it to where I needed to be climbed out of the ducts and dropped down into the transportation garage, the place where shipments of supplies were sent in and out from the facility. John was waiting for me in one of the transport trucks, the engine running and back doors to the storage crate open. I jumped into the back of the truck, closing the doors behind me and heading over closer to the cap where John was driving. A job well done, doctor. I complimented as he pulled out and headed for the exit of the building perimeter. Normally, the place was looked over by guards in the towers and windows, but since they were all busy with the Wendigo, that wasn't much of an issue. 
Even the security cameras weren't able to detect anything out of the ordinary. The windows on the truck were heavily tinted, obscuring the figure of Dr. John, buying us enough time to disappear. So far, everything had gone the way it should have. We had made it out seemingly undetected. The plan had truly gone perfectly. I spoke with the window go. We have to go back for him sometime soon. I told John. To which he snapped his head back in response, taking his eyes off the road momentarily. What? He practically spassed. I made a promise to him that we would return and retrieve him, to release him into freedom. You wanna let another window go home free? Yeah, because that's just what the world needs, isn't it? You fail to understand him the way I do. He is not like the others. I think I can get him to overcome his bloodlust, to not feed on your species. He's a damn Wendigo, Bron. You're really just gonna trust what he says because you struck up a deal with him? Just keep driving, Doctor. I said sternly. We had gotten about 12 miles out. By this point, they had more than likely subdued and put the Wendigo back into containment and we're gonna soon realize Dr. John's absence from the building. We're past the point of no return, John announced. I can't ever go back, not without being shot anyway. We will devise a plan, Doctor, that I guarantee you, but I will go back for him, whether you join me or not. John went silent for a moment as he took a turn, clearly wanting this disagreement to cease. We need to hurry up and leave this truck behind, he said, ignoring my statement. There's a good chance they could have a tracker on it. I question as to why they didn't put one on me, I added. When Dr. West was in the process of designing you, she never thought it would be necessary. She thought that you would be grateful for what the agency was giving you as far as shelter and food. For a woman who was so scientifically gifted and smart, she was quite the fool. Trust me when I say you made the right choice when you chewed her up. The world is much better off without her. I presume she showed you very little kindness as well. I responded. Definitely. Always belittling me every chance she got. No matter what I did, she was always the better scientist, even to credit for some of my work here and there. Once a few hours had passed, and we had traveled nearly a hundred miles, John pulled the truck into an abandoned parking lot for an old law firm building, making this portion of our trip come to an uneventful end. From here, we'll head over to the nearby forest to wait it out for a bit, John pronounced as he retrieved the handgun from his pocket. I also brought a grenade if you were wondering. Brilliant idea, doctor. But you must remember what must happen when things calm down. I told him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He waved me off in a lighthearted fashion. We both exited the vehicle through our separate ways and began to journey over to the woods. It was only minutes after when I stopped us after an idea hit me. Shall we destroy the truck? I proposed giving John a subtle glance. No, that'll attract way too much attention and come off as suspicion. For now, just let them find it. They'll be busy with that piece of evidence and less focused on us. We continued our trek into the untamed landscape. I'll be truthful when I say it felt quite irritating having to move so slow in comparison to what I was used to in order to keep pace with John. The trees were much more dense and plentiful in this particular forest, more than any other I had ever seen before. Vegetation was all around us, growing with seemingly no intention of slowing down. We were only about a mile deep into the terrain. I intended to go at least ten times that before we stopped for the day. Suddenly, I picked up a scent, a strong intoxicating smell of something from above. I wasn't entirely sure what it was, but it was coming closer by the second. I could tell it was moving fast, right in our vicinity. Prepare yourself, I can smell something coming, I said, to which John gripped his handgun, glancing up into the sky, trying to spot whatever was approaching us. Do you know what it is? John asked. A nervous expression crept its way onto his face. No, but you need to get the before I could finish my sentence, 
I was quickly hit with a powerful blow hard enough to send me soaring through the air and slamming into a nearby tree. The hit had dazed me, but only slightly. I was able to quickly get up and recover, standing up and finally getting a look at my attacker. In front of me was a giant avian creature of some sort. It was massive, even taller than me as it stood on the ground. Its wingspan had to be more than 20 feet. Speaking of which, its wings were a dark purple color. Most of its body was. The head of the creature was shaped like that of a rectangle. It didn't have much for a neck, but towards its lower half, it possessed huge, razor-sharp talons that could more than likely hold an entire car in them. Its anatomy was as terrifying as it was strange. Not to mention, its lengthy black beak with multiple rows of jagged teeth, some of which had flesh still stuck between them from previous meals and victims. Blood also coated the edges of its beak. John immediately began to fire his handgun at the cryptid, hitting it with several shots in the wings. This only seemed to anger the entity, despite the fact the bullets penetrated the tissue. It spread its wings further and let out an ear-shattering screech in John's direction. I quickly approached the cryptid to begin my attack. He turned his head to me, preparing for our fight. I pounced from the ground and onto the creature's body, raising my claws to slash at its head before it suddenly jolted itself upwards into the air, causing me to fall off and back onto the ground. John had tried to run, but the creature was far too swift for him, swooping down and grabbing his tender figure in those massive talons. Help! Bron! Please help! He screamed as the cryptid began to lift him into the air, looking at John hungrily as he eagerly waited to feast on his organs. The creature then began to fly in the opposite direction, going deeper into the forest. I quickly got down on all fours and began to chase after it putting every ounce of effort possible into keeping up with the entity. I leaped over rocks, latched onto trees, and jumped from one trunk to another. This creature was fast, but I was gaining ground and closing the gap. The only problem was that I would have to wait until he landed to follow up with an attack. And by that point, John could either be dead or severely injured. Let me go! He shouted before trying to kick his way out of the creature's talons even attempting to shoot him once again. But the gun had clicked when he pulled the trigger, confirming the magazine was empty. I noticed that as the chase went on, the trees in the forest seemed to mysteriously become bigger, more girthy, and even taller in height. The trunks were becoming large enough to house a family of entities inside. This forest was by far a cryptid hotspot. It broke all sorts of biological and natural laws, a perfect place for some curious humans to wander into and find themselves being stalked by whatever lurks within these trees. When the avian creature had started to slow down with John still in his grasp, I picked up the scent of several more beings that smelled just like him. I turned my attention upwards. High up in what was by far the biggest tree we had passed so far sat a gigantic nest, filled with several smaller versions of the avian creature that had snatched John up. It was a female after all. Offspring, I thought. This thing was going to feed John alive to its offspring. Despite being much smaller than their mother and lacking any sort of teeth, they were still sizable enough to easily rip John apart as if he were nothing more than a worm with limbs. And without any ammo left in his weapon to defend himself, that would soon become his agonizing reality. I latched onto the trunk of the tree and hurried north as fast as I could. The offspring of the creature pointed their beaks and squawked excitedly at the sight of their mother approaching with a fresh meal. The hunger was palpable in their eyes. I was halfway up the tree when the mother let out another ground rumbling screech in my direction, putting the sound the babies had produced to complete shame. The hideous mother had dropped John into the nest. The offspring immediately converged on him as I was only feet away. Hey, stay back! Get the hell away from me! He demanded, desperately trying to swat them off and delay his impending doom. One lunged its beak in John's direction, to which John responded by throwing a punch and clocking him at the tip. Even though it did practically nothing to stop the young creature, his courage was admirable. His seconds were dwindling, he didn't have much time left. One of the offspring had grabbed him by the arm when I finally made it up into the nest 
and jammed my claws into the underside of its beak, causing it to release a shrill so unpleasant my very body vibrated from the force. You gotta remember, my hearing is far better than a human's. So while John had complained, my ear canals were brutally stinging from the sound waves bursting to them. The mother was extremely distraught with what I had done with her child. In retaliation, she attempted to swoop down and ram me with her beak, but had missed and instead impacted John, who fell out of the nest and tumbled down to a lower branch on the tree, hanging on for dear life as I tried to make quick work of the satanic birds. Two of the offspring had simultaneously grabbed my arms. I could feel the slimy, saliva-coated flesh of their throats as my hands sank deeper into their esophagus. I countered their efforts by flipping my hands palms up while still inside them, and then straightened my fingers to extend my claws outwards. This caused them to pierce through the back of their necks, which I then followed up by dragging my arms vertically towards the sky until I had reached their brains, instantly killing them. They dropped to the floor of the nest, as dark purple blood had oozed out from their now punctured skulls, soaking the nest beneath us. The mother was now furious, angrier than ever before. It was obvious she wanted to tear me to shreds and make me suffer for what I had done. She flew and did a U-turn in mid-air, circling back and flying towards me as fast as possible while performing another one of her deafening shrills. She proceeded to pull her wings in closer towards her body, increasing her speed as she barreled towards me. I drew my claws out, preparing for the inevitable collision. When she hit me, I was sent flying off the nest and slamming into the top of another tree. But with the speed and force I had collided with, I fell down nearly the entire length of the tree, snapping and cracking a multitude of branches on my way as I descended. When my fall had come to a halt, I was preparing to jump and crawl back to the top to continue the fight, just before John's voice stopped me. Bron, take this! He had shouted from below. I turned my attention and lowered my eyes to John, who stood at the bottom of the tree with boots on the ground. I concluded he must have climbed down the branches while I was going to work on the aerial cryptid. In his hands, he held a grenade, which I'm quite familiar with. I had seen men use them all the time back at the agency during our expeditions. Wait, doctor. Do not pull the pin just yet. I commanded, holding out a hand toward his direction to motion him to seize his movements. I was going to use it when she snatched me up, but I couldn't get a chance to reach into my lab coat. He continued on. When she flies down here, shove this down her beak and kill that flying son of a gun. I wiggled two of my fingernails in an overhear motion. John tossed the grenade to me. I caught it and grasped it firmly in my hand as I tilted my head up to the sky. The giant bird was making another circular lap, coming back for a third blow. Wanting to time it just right to avoid a disaster, I made sure to wait for the perfect opportunity, concentrating on how fast she was closing the distance and deciding from there. I pulled the pin when she was around 50 feet away. The intent, hunger for revenge, and malice in her beady eyes was unlike anything I had witnessed before. She truly wanted to make sure I suffered at her hand. Once she got in range, I jumped up wrapping myself around her feathery body and digging my claws into her back, making sure to drag them up and slice her flesh for some extra damage. She howled, trying to wiggle mid-flight and shake me off, but it was futile. I reached into her beak during screams of agony and shoved the grenade down her throat as quickly as possible, making sure to avoid those serrated teeth. I then retracted my claws from her back and let go falling off and sliding across the ground while kicking up dirt from the leftover momentum from our struggle. I quickly recovered, getting up and turning around to witness what was about to come. She kept soaring through the air, presumably to make another circle to hit me. But as she began to turn, a small but sudden boom erupted from the depths of her beak, echoing off the surrounding trees. Nearly half her head had been taken off and destroyed by the explosion exposing her weirdly shaped skull and coating the vegetation nearby in her now signature dark purple blood. Oh my god! John exclaimed from behind. That was just... I don't even know how to describe it. We did it! I helped kill a freaking cryptid! And for the first time in nearly my entire life, I smiled. 
amused by John's enthusiasm and proud of our teamwork. I scurried over back to him. He held out his hand in the air for some strange reason as I approached. Why are you doing that, doctor? I inquired. It's a high five. You've never done one before? No, but I'd be willing to try. I reached out my right hand and slapped my palm against his, to which he immediately snarled in pain as he grasped his wrists. Ah, I forgot about the, uh, the strength. I'll be fine. He whined, vigorously shaking his hand. We should quiet down, doctor. I told him, before something else hears us. Right, right. He followed up. Well, I guess you could say I'm the brains, and you're the... Braun? I turned and simply looked at him with a blank expression. He seemed to become slightly skittish, blushing mildly as he rubbed the hand I'd slapped with mine. Let's get moving. Dr. John and I had come across an abandoned cabin ten miles deep into the forest. It was evident to both of us that we would be staying there for the time being. It was also more than likely that us killing the avian creature had attracted the attention of other cryptids, and they would soon be there to clean up what was left. The shadows of the trees were growing stronger. We needed to be efficient. I've stated in the past that I wasn't keen on the idea of bringing others with me, but John was intelligent and much more of an asset than a liability. I slowly approached the steps of the front deck to the cabin, crawling across the ground on all fours. Dr. John was close behind, putting in an effort to be as quiet as possible. The cabin itself was in decent shape, but not pristine shape. There were rotting spots in the wood. The steps to the deck were dented. The front left window had a crack running up the middle. Vegetation was beginning to grow its way up the sides of the foundation. I sniffed the air, seeing if I could pick up the scent of any sort of entity within the structure, but was relieved when I came up with nothing. It seemed safe for the moment. I smell nothing, doctor. It should be safe, but still be cautious of your surroundings. John nodded clearly on board with my assessment. Well, you're the expert. He huffed lightly before following my lead up to the deck. I sliced the remaining integrity of the lock off with my claws and pushed the door open, letting us both inside. I stood up in a bipedal fashion once in the foyer, the ceiling being about nine feet high, only giving me a foot of headroom. In case there was anything inside that was masking its scent, John and I still did a sweep of the interior, wanting to be thorough about whether or not we were alone. We found nothing but spiderwebs and dust, along with an assortment of old silverware in the kitchen, confirming we were the only beings in the cabin. Pretty soon, we're gonna have to think about food, John announced, bringing in a stack of kindling for the old cracked and worn down stone fireplace in the foyer. Indeed, I replied. In fact, I can journey out even and see if I can kill something and bring it back while you build the fire. Distribution of labor. John looked up as he began to arrange and stack the kindling into the fireplace, seemingly pleased by my proposal. Well, hurry up. It's nearly dark. Not that I'm too worried about you. I just... He trailed off. What is it, doctor? I inquired shifting my gaze towards him. I just don't want to be alone when it gets dark, even if we're inside. I don't want to sound like I'm a coward. I just... I raised the fingernail into the ear, cutting off his sentence. I understand. You don't have to explain yourself, doctor. I'll attempt to be back as soon as possible. Stay quiet and keep low. You don't want to draw the attention of whatever might be lurking within these trees. And with that... I opened the door, got back down on all fours, and crawled out into the forest, my night vision starting to kick in as it got darker. I went west of the cabin, continuously sniffing the air to see if I could pick up any foreign scents, mainly of something like a deer. I knew that John and I wouldn't be able to stay here for long, one because the agency would come for us, 
and it wouldn't be long before they found us. Two, the other cryptids would realize our presence and attempt to kill or take John, seeing as he's human. Three, because I made a promise to a Wendigo back at the facility that I would return within a reasonable time period to come free him, provided he holds up his end of the agreement and only feeds on animals and other monsters, not human flesh. I wasn't familiar with this forest, so navigating and keeping track of where I was going proved to be difficult. I made sure to make a mental note of where the cabin was, in the event I needed to return quickly. As I pushed through bushes and maneuvered through the trees, I finally began to pick up on a scent. A strong, horrendously powerful, but familiar scent. Blood. I followed the smell, only becoming more potent the closer I got to the source. It was fresh and I'm sure I wouldn't be the only thing making my way towards it. There was a large clearing in the trees up ahead. I could make out a bulky figure standing and or kneeling over something else, presumably its kill. I latched onto one of the trees on the edge of the clearing and climbed upwards to get a better view, as well as keeping the element of surprise. I glanced toward the ground, and a new scent had combined itself with the blood. It was charred flesh, as if multiple layers of skin had been burnt to a crisp. I recoiled, seeing as how suddenly and simultaneously explosively it had emerged into my nostrils. On the ground, I was met with the sight of what looked like to be a bipedal creature knelt down over a pack of five dead wolves. All of them torn to shreds, either missing a head, half their body, a leg, or ears two of which suffered losing all four. The creature wasn't very tall, maybe five and a half feet at most, but it was extremely muscular, dark blue veins running along its arms. Its skin was patchy, some of it being burnt to a crispy black, while others were a more elegant light brown. It possessed short patches of dark green hair on the areas where it lacked burns. On the top of its head sat not two, but three curved horns white like bones and sharp at the tip like plates. The creature noticed my presence, turning around as it let out a deep snarl. Its face consisted of a triangular shaped mouth like razor sharp but blood stained teeth, above which were a row of five blue glowing eyes, all fixated on me as I stayed perched up in the tree. In its left hand, it clutched the severed head of one of the wolves blood still oozing its way out below the snout. This entity didn't appear to have any claws or fingernails, just six long meaty and horrifically charred fingers on each hand. Mine, 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 it repeated in a raspy voice with an echo so powerful it could be heard for potentially miles on end. It dropped the wolf head and bared its teeth at me, performing its idea of challenging me to combat. Even though I hadn't come out here searching for a battle, it had already seen me. I didn't know the full extent of its senses and abilities, but I couldn't risk it following me back to the cabin where John was vulnerable. So I did the only thing that seemed logical at the time. I scurried down from the tree and stood as tall as possible, opening my hands and letting my claws be put on full display as I had done many times before. The cryptid immediately charged, not wasting any time speaking or continuing its attempts to intimidate me. I was prepared. I started out by sidestepping the creature as he began to frantically swing his fists while on his rampage in my direction. A punch of his connected with the trunk of the tree just behind me, hollowing out a large portion of the wood and sending splinters flying through the air as a result of the heavy impact. I wrapped a hand around one of the creature's horns and proceeded to lift him and swing his body in a circle for a brief second, before slamming him into the already damaged trunk. His mass colliding with the tree caused it to fall over and hit the ground, creating an obnoxiously loud boom throughout the forest. The entity had caught me off guard with a swing from its right fist after recovering from the days of the attack, launching me back nearly a dozen feet towards the clearing, right into the decimated wolf corpses. The force of the blow was unlike any other I had received before. But it was going to take much more than that to make me yield. 
I got up as the creature charged yet again, raising both its fists and preparing to slam them down on my torso. When it was within range, I simply leapt forward this time, my slim figure allowing me to pass through the gap of its two forearms as they were in the air and land behind it. I wasted no time by following it up with a counterattack. I lunged towards its back and sank my claws as deep as I could into its flesh, causing it to squeal and shriek as an almost rainbow pattern stream of blood leaked out onto my arms. Its screams of pain were in shocking contrast to that of its growls and snarls of aggression and malice. In retaliation, the creature delivered a swift but explosive elbow to my chest, sending me onto the ground and sliding across the dirt. My hideous opponent was beyond furious, but also desperate. Blood was seeping from the wounds I had inflicted on his back. I lifted myself off the ground and pounced on the weeping creature, extending out an arm near his face and dragging my claws across his eyes, completely blinding him. He thrashed around violently as he reached over in order to grab me. I kept maneuvering and moving around to keep myself out of his grasp as his howls of pain continued to flood my ears. I kept myself latched onto the creature's back as I continued to slash and tear at his tissue. He was able to throw me off his back, but not before I grabbed one of the horns on top of his head and tore it out of its spot. The screams before were nothing in comparison to what he bellowed after that. I gripped the horn in my right hand, lunged at him one last time, and came down on him, letting out a snarl of my own as I jammed the horn into the top of his skull and dug it deep enough to hit his brain. The entity's movements ceased. It let out a lengthy but faint breath as its last few seconds of life faded away, soon collapsing on the ground and its body going limp. He was dead now. That much was apparent. And, since I was hungry, I decided to indulge myself in his corpse, ripping and tearing as much meat off his bones as I could until I was satisfied. Loads of his oddly colored blood had dripped down my chin and onto my chest. I wiped it away after finishing my feast and stood up. Soon, animals and other cryptids would converge on the site of our chaotic and brutal showdown, presumably to clean up what was left over. I noticed a bit of my own dark blue colored blood drip to the ground from a small puncture wound on my waist. My chest also ached from the first hit I had taken from the creature towards the start of the fight. But I knew it would heal soon enough, and I would be fine. I left the clearing after looking around for a bit, killed a couple squirrel on the way back to the cabin for John to eat. I didn't have time to look for anything bigger or more filling, not with John still at the cabin by himself, with no weapons left for self-defense. What took you so long? He exclaimed as I let myself in, being careful not to stand up too fast and hit my head on the ceiling. I was unfortunate enough to encounter a cryptid. I replied. I couldn't risk it following me back here and discovering you. John's expression of annoyance quickly shifted into one of gratitude, but also pride. He seemed quite impressed at what I considered as a casual announcement. Oh, well, thank you. That was probably the right call. I mean, after all, you're the boogeyman's boogeyman. Without responding verbally, I held out the corpse of the squirrel I had snatched up on the way back. John looked at it blankly, unimpressed by what was in front of him. That's my dinner, I'm guessing? He asked, already aware of the answer. Precisely, I responded, raising my opposite hand and pointing a finger toward the fireplace, which was now lit, the smell of smoke lingering in the foyer as the flames danced around the wood. Well, I found some knives in the kitchen after I finished up making the fire. I'll get one to cut this poor guy. John announced, holding up the deceased squirrel above his head. John went on and did as he proposed, skinning and gutting the dead creature, although he didn't appear to be very skilled at it. There wasn't enough time for him to perfect his craft. We had to keep moving in the morning. I sat with John by the fire as he allowed his meal to cook. An experience I never had previously. It was soothing. The only time I ever had to relax was in my containment cell back at the facility. I was put in there between operations or missions. 
Granted, they allowed me to roam around inside. But there wasn't much to entertain or stimulate me. I accepted it back then, saw it as a positive, and didn't question the nature of why I was in there. But now I know. The more and more I reflect, the more I realize how cruel they truly were to me, despite them spending decades manipulating me into thinking the contrary. But instead of focusing on my own suffering, I turned my attention to John, who stared uneventfully into the fire as his meat was being cooked. Doctor, before we had escaped, when I intervened in your fight with the other scientist, he mentioned your daughter has been taken by a cryptid. I stated. Is that true? John's eyes widened, taken aback by what I had just brought up. But he kept his composure, even though I could see a look of despair emerging onto his face, the kind of despair only a grieving father could hold. Yes, he replied softly. It's why I joined the agency, to study and learn more about the supernatural, the things that were here before us and will be here after. I thought that maybe if I learned enough, then I could find her, maybe save her. But it's pretty stupid to think that she's still alive. Don't feel bad. It's just reality. Us? I quizzed. Confused by his wording. Yes, us, he repeated. Listen, Bron, I don't consider you a monster. Not at all. I'm truly sorry for what the agency did to you for so long. All their lies and deceit. I should have done something sooner. I was just being a damn coward. I immediately put a hand on John's back, being careful not to pierce his skin with my claws. You are no coward, Doctor. You defended and stood your ground for me, even when it wasn't your place to do so. You've assisted me in conquering a threat that was far beyond your understanding and range of knowledge, even when you could have died. The only coward I've ever met is Dr. West. A smirk crept up on John's face, drastically changing the energy of his mood. He kept turning the meat over the fire as he replied, Yeah, but thanks to you. She's six feet under. He huffed as his eyes stared forward. John retracted the meat from the flames. With it now fully cooked, he brought it towards the center of the floor we sat on, placing it on an old cloth he had presumably discovered while looking around the cabin. Of all the people I've met, you're the most human out of all of them. John vocalized, taking a glance up towards my eyes. I'm grateful for your kindness, doctor. But this world, your species, they will never accept me. No matter how much I may try to prove otherwise, I will always be a monster in their eyes, and nothing more. But that won't stop me from protecting your kind. That's extremely noble of you, Bron, protecting a group that doesn't deserve it. I know we're definitely not saints, but I guess we're salvageable, he said with a hint of sarcasm near the end. The rest of the night went as expected. John and I discussed our views on the world and the predicament we were currently in. He even taught me certain social customs and things humans do that I didn't know of, like fist pumping, which was odd, seeing as he had just informed me of the gesture of high-fiving not long ago. John finished his dinner, and we soon drifted off to sleep. Although he ended up sleeping far longer than I did, I only needed a few hours of sleep due to the way I was designed. John awoke as the sun had just finished rising. Birds were outside chirping away as the morning light shone through the windows. We didn't waste any time. He and I exited the cabin and began journeying deeper into the forest. John bringing along the knife he had used to prepare his meal the previous night as a last resort weapon. You know, when my daughter was taken and I realized I wouldn't ever get her back, I considered ending it all. Just a few too many pills, and the pain would all be over. I thought there was no point to living if I didn't have her around. John announced with an almost apathetic tone, as if he had just informed me that he stepped on a twig. And the pain in his eyes was vivid. I could tell he was masking what he truly felt. 
I was sure he was used to it due to his line of work, always concealing his grief for the sake of the mission and in the name of progress. I stopped us both, looking at John as he tried to avoid eye contact. I'm truly sorry. If I were there to save her, I would have done it in a heartbeat. I stated, I know nothing about such experience, but I can guarantee you are a great father. We approached close to the clearing where I had fought and killed a strange entity last night. All the leftover biomass and body parts were gone. It was easy to assume wildlife and other cryptids had come to clean up overnight, only leaving patches of blood spread out across the grass. Jesus, you weren't kidding when you said you messed them up pretty good. John stated, pointing at the side of the aftermath. He seemed quite upset, I interrupt. Before I could finish my sentence, a repetitive whooshing and whipping caused me to turn my head toward the sky. John was slightly confused at first, wondering what it was I was reacting to. But, in several seconds, it came within his range of hearing. Shit! Helicopter! He exclaimed in a forceful whisper. Get low! Now! I shot back. John and I both lowered ourselves to the ground as fast as possible, crawling behind some bushes in an attempt to keep ourselves more effectively hidden. They know we're in this forest. We've got to get out of here soon, before they cut off all our exits. I told you it would have been wise to destroy the truck. They surely tracked it here. It was foolish to leave it be. Now we're in jeopardy. The helicopter hovered over the clearing for several seconds before descending. Eight soldiers with gears I had recognized emerged from the vehicle. Four from each side. They curiously circled the clearing after exiting, investigating and looking over the blood as John and I watched from behind the bushes and trees. The helicopter itself was mounted with what looked to be machine guns and small capacity missile launchers of its own, clearly doubling as a transport and combat vehicle. They were soldiers from the agency. Speaking of which, one grabbed his radio, pushing down the button and speaking into it as he looked over the area. Come in, command. This is Agent Ben reporting in with Team X-1. We're at the site now, with evidence of some sort of feeding frenzy that took place. There are currently no concrete signs of Subject 16A or Dr. Jonathan R. Dilliard, but we'll keep looking. Actually, one of the other agents called out. You might want to take a look at this. He punctuated by pointing towards the ground. When I had realized what it is he was talking about, I could physically feel the blood stop itself mid-flow in my veins. The soldier was pointing at a particular patch of blood. My blood. The blood of mine that had seeped out of my miniscule wound after the confrontation with the cryptid. But it was enough to be seen. It might be his. The agent followed up, kneeling down to get a better look. Let's get a sample and get it back to the lab. We'll let the geeks run their tests and do their thing. The other replied. John crawled over closer to me, looking into my eyes with grand intentions. It appeared by just his facial expression alone that he had hatched a plan. Use your claws to tear some of my lab coat, he asked, yanking at the fabric. His idea had quickly clicked in my mind. I did as requested and quietly ripped some of the material of his lab coat with two of my fingernails. John scratched his own cheeks and forehead hard enough to just draw blood and then scraped his hand against the ground, rubbing mud on his clothes and skin to make it appear as if he had just escaped an attack. Climb up one of these trees and get the vantage point. I'm gonna bluff long enough to get them all in a close enough spot where you can take them out without any disaster. He informed me. Be careful, doctor. I nodded to him, following his request and using stealth and precision to scale the tree closest to me. John sighed, clearly nervous about what was going to go down. He raised himself up and began to march toward the clearing, making sure to walk with the limp for a more convincing effect. The soldiers quickly turned their attention and pointed their assault rifles at John. Come in, command. Come in, command. Dr. Jonathan R. Dilliard has just been spotted. Requesting orders. The biggest of the bunch said after fidgeting with his radio. 
and John held his hands high in the air. I could only see the back of him for now, but I could smell the fear coming off of him. He was terrified, yet still doing what needed to be done. Don't shoot! John pleaded. You don't understand. Subject 16A, he, he forced me. He said he would kill me just like he did West if I didn't help him escape. He made me drive him and dump him out here. I only just barely got away. It was unclear whether or not the men had bought his story. They still kept their rifles trained on him, not letting their guard down. We have orders to kill 16A once we find him. One of the agents in the back shouted. Where was he last at before you got away? There's a cabin about half a mile from this clearing. I can take you to it, but we gotta be careful. 16A isn't the only thing in these woods. He punctuated by pointing at all the blood on the ground. The agents all turned and looked at each other, debating whether or not it was a smart move to follow John. I was thoroughly impressed with his ability to keep calm in the face of such overwhelming odds. We'll go with you, doctor, said the agent in the front. But you gotta stay in our sight. You try to cut and run or pull a fast one. I'll personally make sure you end up a Swiss cheese. Or better yet, I might even let 16A have his way with you before we take him out too. The man then turned and nodded his head to the pilot in the helicopter, signaling for him to stay behind. John motioned at the group and began to lead them out of the clearing towards the cabin. I stayed behind and didn't immediately follow. I wanted to wait a bit. The agents knew I often liked to move from tree to tree, so if I were too close and they had decided to look up, it would surely mean the death of John and potentially me as well. It's a shame what happened to West, said the leading soldier. Really? I kinda thought she was a nutcase, replied one of the agents towards the rear of the line. All the others seemed to agree with the latter, a few of them even nodding their heads to further the point. I maintained my silent movements as I followed the men from up in the trees, sizing them all up as we approached closer to the cabin. There's the place, Doc, one of the agents inquired, pointing the barrel of his rifle toward the cabin. Yes, but please be careful, he might still be inside, John said, feigning concern. The agents all raised their weapons and slowly surrounded the perimeter of the cabin. Two went right up to the front door, presumably to breach it. They looked at each other for a few moments, before one clutched his rifle, leaned back, and kicked the door down. Despite the fact I already sliced the lock off. The pair entered to search the interior, while the other six kept themselves posted around the perimeter, keeping them in close enough range to take them out, but also not get overwhelmed. I started with the back of the cabin, swiftly but quietly jumping down from the tree and right behind the guards. Before they could react, I quickly grabbed them each by the skull and slammed their heads together, using just enough force to knock them both unconscious for the time being. And, just to be on the safe side, I also grabbed and squeezed their radio devices, crushing them in my hands and cutting off their communications. I was also careful enough to not leave them sprawled out too close to the windows where they could be seen, not wanting the agents inside to sound the alarm if they caught a glimpse of their unconscious comrades. I moved fast, scaling my way up the back wall of the cabin and onto the roof. Hey, did you hear something? One of the guards posted on the right side said. Nick, would you relax? You always get paranoid when we're doing operations, replied the one next to him. While on the roof, I shifted over towards the right side of the structure, silently leaning over and peering down below at the agents as they watched the tree line. I repeated the same set of actions I had done with the first pair, then crawled back up to the roof, maneuvered to the left side, and did it once again, only leaving the pair that was searching the inside of the cabin still left. Still moving around the roof on all fours, I made my way over to the front and signaled to John to lure out the remaining two agents. Hey, quick, get out here now! He shouted. There's something coming! The two agents rushed outside pointing their rifles all around in a frantic attempt to find out what it was John was talking about. What is it, Doc? exclaimed the leader towards John. I dropped down and pounced on the two guards, slamming one against the wood and letting him slump to the floor of the deck. 
the other one was able to fire a shot off before I grabbed him. The bullet struck me in the waist, and a small puddle of my blood splashed onto the dusty wood finish below us. Instead of immediately knocking him out, I went for his gun first, yanking it from his grasp and slamming it hard enough on the railing of the deck to snap it in half. He attempted to hit the button on his radio and alert command what was happening. But I was quicker and used my claws to slash off his index finger and thumb before they could make contact. He fell to his knees, clutching the stumps as blood pulled around his hand. I grabbed his neck and began wrapping my fingers around his throat and lifting him into the air as I stood up by Peter Lee. Let me go! Let me go, you ugly son of a bitch! He squirmed, making futile efforts to escape my hold. I bared my teeth. The stinging from the gunshot wound had begun to bother me, but it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it would be. It would heal soon enough. The agents utilized armor-piercing rounds on missions, which is what I assumed had hit me. At least now I had the answer to whether or not I was bulletproof. Dr. John marched over with a smug look on his face, as I held the still struggling agent. Just would like to get the record straight and say that I came up with this plan, but I couldn't have done it without my buddy Braun here. He taunted. You're both a couple of worthless traitors. The agent shot back. Nothing but two cowards who can't face their responsibility. Don't even know why we're wasting resources trying to get you back or kill you. But when it does happen, I'll be more than happy to watch you both be executed. You freaks. That word came up again. Freak. God, I hated it. I used to play it off and ignore the instances where someone called me that word. But I was done tolerating it. All those years I had let it slide. But no more. I turned and slung the agent hard enough to send him crashing through one of the front windows and colliding with the fireplace in the foyer. When he impacted it with the stone, dust dispersed itself vertically and horizontally from behind his back before he fell face first onto the floor. The spot where he had impacted it had left a dent. A dent that was dripping with an uneven coating of blood. Even John was shocked. He stepped past all the broken glass from the window and slowly approached the agent's body, rolling up his sleeve and checking for a pulse. He's dead, John confirmed. Jesus, Bron, you threw him hard enough to kill him. Not that I blame you. To be completely truthful, I hadn't meant to actually kill the man. The combination from the irritation from the gunshot wound and his continuous arrogance had flared up my rage, causing me to use more force than I had originally intended. Even covered in body armor and gear, he still couldn't handle the force of the impact. The second human being I had ever killed. But unlike Dr. West, this death didn't feel satisfying or cathartic. Rather, it caused me to feel quite guilty even despite the anger I had felt towards him. Don't feel bad, Prana. He was far from a good man, John said, almost sensing the change in my demeanor. It's not like you just slaughtered the whole squad like some bloodthirsty monster. I know he didn't have time for me to stand there and reflect on what had taken place. I ordered John to grab one of the unconscious soldier's rifles, along with the two radios I hadn't yet destroyed, and follow me back to the helicopter. The pilot was still sitting inside the cockpit. The look on his face was one of complete and utter terror as he spotted John and I emerging from the trees and into the clearing. He attempted to try and read a command for help, but with my speed and disregarding my wound, I ran across the clearing on all fours and leapt into the helicopter, grabbing the pilot's arm and stopping him. You will not say a word to them, but if they choose to contact you, you will inform them everything is going according to plan. Otherwise, I will put an end to you and pick your bones clean. I growled, burying my teeth just inches from the pilot's face. He took my threat seriously, and that itself was a massive understatement, considering I picked up the scent of urine suddenly coming from his crotch area. John boarded the helicopter after finishing his dash across the clearing, panting heavily as he clutched the rifle he had picked up. Take us back to Site 12. If you try anything funny... I'll paint the windows with your brain matter, John ordered the pilot. 
keeping the rifle aimed at his head. The pilot, sweating and slightly shaking in horror, maneuvered the helicopter out of the clearing and ascended the three of us into the sky. The helicopter radar crackled to life soon afterward. This is command. Please confirm mission status. I repeat, this is command. Please confirm mission status. The pilot's eyes frantically darted around. John pressed the barrel harder against his temple. I drew my claws, waving them slightly near the pilot in order to intimidate him. And this is Chopper Y-32. Mission was a failure. Dr. Jonathan R. Dilliard and Subject 16A have yet to be discovered and or eliminated. Hit him back to base. Although it wasn't what we told him to say, it still worked in our favor nonetheless. The ride itself wasn't very long due to the method of transportation. It went by far faster than we had traveled here in the truck. John kept his rifle up against the pilot's head the entire time. I was uncomfortable during most of the ride due to having to lean over while inside the cockpit because of my height. Or are you guys gonna kill me? The pilot asked, making sure his radio was muted. Not if you do what we ask. John replied, What do you guys even want? Money? Guns? We want salvation for both men encrypted. I snarled. And for the agency to pay for its crimes. Once the facility came into view, John and I ordered the pilot to fly to the south end of the building, but still kept us hovering well above the ground. I couldn't simply go inside and free the wind to go. Not how I did it last time. We got lucky, and John was able to talk his way through security and get the cameras disabled, while I convinced the Wendigo of our plan. Not to mention it was now daytime, which meant more guards roaming the halls. We needed a distraction. And I knew just what it would be. A missile from the helicopter, right at the north end of the building where the weapons vault was located. Not only would it be detrimental to their ability to defend themselves, but it would draw them away from the Wendigo cages, long enough for me to free the one I had made to deal with. We see you within range to land, Chopper Y-32. Just wanting to confirm your coordinates. Came a female voice from the radio. The interior security camera wouldn't come into play this time around. Not only would they be unlikely to be monitored in real time during all the commotion, but there is a good chance the explosion would corrupt and destroy their ability to function properly. Fire a rocket. John demanded the pilot. Northeastern corner. What? The pilot shrieked. Are you insane? No! I growled, reinforcing John's command. Sweat dripped itself down from the pilot's forehead as he reached a shaky finger over to the launch button on the cockpit control panel. I could feel the vibrations of the helicopter as the rocket tore through the air and hit its designated target. The explosion was deafening, sending massive shockwaves through the air as flames engulfed the surrounding area before quickly dissipating. I told the pilot to hover the helicopter over the roof of the building. The sounds of rapid footsteps, yelling and voices filled my ears. The alarms weren't going off, confirming the explosion had damaged the system. Once I retrieve the Wendigo, I will return to you, Doctor. Get out of here. Fly deep into the forest and wait for our arrival. I said in a rushed tone. John tightened his grip on the rifle, hesitant to do as I proposed. But what about you? Go! I shouted. Before they shoot this helicopter down. I jumped out of the side and onto the roof. John stared at the pilot as he quickly turned the helicopter around and began flying into the forest behind the building, doing it just in time before they were shut down. The cryptid containment cells were on the south end of the building, the complete opposite side of where we caused all the commotion. Agents were flooding outside with what little amount of weapons they had left, trying to find any other threats in the area. My gunshot wound had nearly healed completely, so it didn't give me much trouble as I crawled along the roof to the south end of the facility. I found an exterior air duct vent. I quickly wrapped my claws around the cover and tore it off before crawling inside. While scurrying around, I made a trip to the boiler room I had encountered while hiding in the walls earlier on. 
I grabbed the most girthy and solid steel beam I could find and took it with me. After which, I journeyed it over to the cryptid containment cells, specifically the windigo cages. I dropped down from the ceiling after exiting the air duct. And there he was, standing docile behind the strong glass, just staring off into space. Although he perked up when he saw me. For once, I saw some spark of life in those sunken deer skull eyes. I wasted no time. I began to hit the reinforced glass as hard as I could with the beam. Swing after swing, impact after impact, and it finally cracked. It actually worked. I pulled the beam back, and with all my might, swung one last time, finally breaking the glass. The Wendigo was joyful as he slowly stepped out into freedom. Not that it was easy to tell from looks alone. You were honest, he said in what I assumed to be his default voice without mimicking anything or anyone. It was a low, yet not extremely bassy tone, resembling the loud whisper of an average man. Follow me, I advised. Be prepared, we may have to fight, but you must remember our bargain. No killing the humans unless absolutely necessary. Saying it almost made me feel hypocritical, considering earlier events. I let the window go down the hall. We both got down and did our best to move quickly towards one of the side exits on the facility. I was quite a bit faster, but slowed down enough for us to be within a reasonable distance of each other. You kept your word, he said as we dashed down the hall. As I said I would. I replied, while keeping my eyes lit upon the side in front of us. I picked up the scent of a cart around the corner. We'd surely have to take him out before moving on. As to why he hadn't joined his comrades at the explosion site was questionable. When we rounded the corner, the cart was paralyzed in pure terror as he got a look at the Wendigo and me. I pounced across the floor and grabbed him before he could react, slamming his head against the wall on the right and letting him fall unconscious. I laid eyes on one of the doors with emergency exit labeled above it. I didn't stop running, and neither did the window go as he trailed close behind. I threw my weight at the door, causing it to be yanked right off its hinges and slam onto the ground. Into the forest, I announced, beginning to dash into the tree line as the window go followed. I could only hope this would be the last time I'd ever have to set foot inside that cursed building. After I had picked up John's scent, it wasn't long enough before we were reunited. He was still taken aback by the sight of another entity with me. He originally disagreed with my plan to free the creature. I motioned for the Wendigo to follow me into the helicopter with John and the pilot. Speaking of which, the pilot seemed to be even more horrified at the prospect of a Wendigo being added to the roster of passengers. Uh, it's... Nice to meet you, John scratched his head, looking up at the deer skull, still hesitant at the presence. The Wendigo gave no response, simply keeping quiet as he sat in the back of the helicopter next to me. John had told us he had a location in mind of where to go, although he refused to give out the specific details for whatever reason. But even though this wasn't the last of the agency, they had taken quite a hit at their ability to function. For now, we would be free of their wrath and tyrannical ways. I turned my attention to the Wendigo. He sat idly looking out the window at everything as we passed by below, seemingly entranced by his freedom, similar to how I felt. They have a tracker on this helicopter, John exclaimed. So this time, I'll take your advice, Bron, and we'll thrash this thing as soon as we get to the spot. I simply nodded in response, not taking my eyes off my new ally. He seemed to have sensed I was looking. He turned, causing his antlers to slightly scrape the ceiling above him. I asked the quiet creature, one simple question. Would you like a name?